Good afternoon. I'm Susan Shirk. I'm the chair of the 21st Century China Center here at UC San Diego, based here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. And it is my distinct honor and thrill to open up the UC San Diego Forum on US-China Relations, the first meeting of what we hope will be an ongoing process. It's very exciting for me because I'm You know, all of us uh, involved in the U.S.-China relationship ha are, of course, extremely worried about the sharp deterioration of relations, and we uh, feel a sense of responsibility to try to figure out how to stabilize the relationship and put it on a positive footing uh, for the future doesn't mean necessarily going back to the old way of doing things, so we really need to be creative and uh, think out uh, how do we move forward to prevent these two great countries uh, from becoming enemies, decoupling their very intertwined economies and technological ecosystems, universities, societies in a way that would be extremely wrenching and destructive to the interests not just of the Chinese people and the American people, but really uh, all of humanity. Uh, so the stakes are very high, and that's why we have convened this forum uh, that will be meeting all week here in La Jolla to discuss how we move forward. Um, I want to thank the members of the China Leadership Board of the 21st Century China Center, and um, of course, the sponsors and contributors who have made this forum possible, East West Bank, Qualcomm, Coral Holdings, Legler, Benbow Foundation, Asia Group Foundation, and individuals, especially um, Kurt Campbell, our wonderful co-chair, and others. Uh, and really, their support has made this forum possible. I've been so uh, fortunate to co-chair this forum with Steve Hadley and Kurt Campbell, and the three of us have worked very hard to develop a, a program uh, that will be productive and interesting for the 50 plus participants who are here uh, to participate in the forum, uh, mostly Americans, but with a number of influential uh, and thoughtful friends from China as well. So uh, at the end of the forum, we hope to have some important takeaways that we'll be able to share with you afterwards. So now, without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Peter Cowie. Oh, before I do that, I'd like to say that um, I'm going to introduce, of course, our panelists, and then I want to mention that uh, we want to devote a lot of today's uh, session to a conversation with the audience, and we have passed out index cards for you to write your questions. If you want an index card, if you think you're likely to be wanting to ask a question, you know, just raise your hand, somebody will come around and give you one, and, um, uh, and then collect them afterwards. So um, we're very fortunate to have uh, a three individuals who have rich experience as diplomats working on US-China relations. 
uh, Tom Donilon, who is the National Security Advisor for President Barack Obama, and um, Zhang Ping, Ambassador Zhang Ping, who uh, is the Consul General of the People's Republic of China in Los Angeles. Originally, Ambassador Sui Tian Kai hoped to be here with us, but he had very pressing events uh, in Washington that prevented him from doing that. Um, and we're sorry not to have him here with us, but we're so pleased that Ambassador Zhang, who is a very experienced, authoritative Chinese diplomat with 10 years of experience working uh, in the United States, is able to participate today. And then we have uh, Steve Hadley, who is the National Security Advisor per, for President George W. Bush. So. Um, the topic is how to restore a new equilibrium, uh, but we certainly hope they'll reflect on their experience and give us some wisdom for the future. We know they will. I'm gonna now turn, uh, the moderation of the panel will be done by my wonderful colleague, Dean Peter Cowie of the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Thank you. Well, welcome to all of you. Uh, this forum uh, and today's opening session really represents the best spirit of the American Research University. We can be a neutral, authoritative place for the of great people to talk in the spirit of candor and respect about issues facing our society. Know that the relationship between the U.S. and China has reached a moment of recalibration. And that recalibration requires a mixture of a resolve to speak frankly about the difficulties in the relationship, the discipline to listen carefully and patiently to each other, and the resolve to create a fruitful way of moving forward in a bilateral relationship that will, more than any other bilateral diplomatic relationship in the 21st century, shape the welfare of global society. So we thank you for joining us in this moment of candid conversation and careful and respectful listening. Our format today is going to be very simple. I'm going to ask uh, first Tom Donlan, then Ambassador Chong Ping, and then Steve Hadley, to each do some opening remarks of about 10 minutes. Uh, after their individual remarks, I'm going to take uh, a round of questions on my own in which I'm going to ask them each one question. And then the cards that have been distributed to the audience allow you to write down questions that you would like uh, me to explore during the broader question and answer session. I'll do my best to synthesize and state what seem to be the most pressing questions uh, with the largest number of people interested uh, for the purposes of representing the views of the audience. So with that said, let me turn to the first of our very distinguished guests, Tom Dow. Okay, thank you, Peter. Does it sound okay? Is that all right? Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, I think you said it absolutely correctly. There is no more important issue for diplomacy for the United States and China than, than trying to manage through the next period of the U.S.-China relationship. There just isn't a more important, a more important question. It's great to be here at, the, at San Diego, uh, Peter and, and Susan. I also want to say that I recognize Governor Brown, who's here uh, as well, and we look forward to your participation in the, in the conference as well, Governor. So let me start. I think I'll, I'll start, Peter, if it's all right, with, with laying down some context uh, for the discussion, and then have my colleagues follow on with uh, with suggestions how to manage our way through some of the context. I think the first point is that uh, U.S.-China relations have entered into a much more competitive phase. Uh, and we're in a period of really uh, significant change in the relationship. And ma as, as a matter of fact, I'd argue that the relationship is going through uh, the most change, the most significant change that it's gone through in the years since the establishment of formal relations between the United States uh, and China in the late 1970s 
and the opening up of the Chinese economy uh, to the world in the late 70s and early 1980s. I put this proposition to uh, uh, good friends in China, the leadership, and I don't get much pushback on this. This is a really significant moment uh, for US-China uh, US relations. Um, and indeed, if you think back in 40 years, a lot of things happened in 40 years, right? You know, uh, during the course of the relationship. Indeed, I don't think that, that the, um, the architects of the relationship in the late 1970s on either side could have imagined what the relationship is today. Uh, extraordinary amount of interaction between our countries um, and, and, and rising tension as well as a result, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. You know, some uh, folks try to compare this to the Cold War. One statistic, I think, kind of distinguishes it pretty dramatically. Uh, in the late 1980s, the total trade between the United States and the Soviet Union was about $2 billion a year. That's the total trade between the United States and China every day. So there's a massive difference, I think, between this and the, uh, and the, uh, and the Cold War. That said, uh, if you look back in the last couple of years, as we move to the point where we are today, I think our, our friend Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, who's going to be participating in our discussions, has said it right, which is we're going to look back, I think, on 2018 as a really pivotal year. I think it's the year where on both sides that the relationship moved from one that was predominantly one of strategic cooperation, and that had really been the thrust really since Richard Nixon's foray to China in February of 1972, and it really has moved, I think, to be more dominated by, or primarily dominated by, strategic competition. And indeed, in some areas, I'd argue, intense, uh, intense rivalry. I think this is part of an overall trend in the world, though, that goes, uh, that, uh, that we're, we, don't, we don't talk about a lot in the, in the US-China context, but, it, but it's a part of this. And that is that we really are at the end of, a, of, of, a, of an important era. We're at the end of the post-Cold War period. During the 25 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, it, we had a period where the United States was dominant and where the great powers were engaged in productive and constructive relationships principally. Uh, not, none of them regard each other particularly as a military threat. And that's changed. Uh, we are that period of US dominance in the, in the global scene and the way that it was in that 25 year period. And the level of cooperation and constructive, uh, constructive uh, activities between the great powers and among the great powers, that period is over, I think. We're in a new, we're in a new era. Um, and this is particularly the case in the US-China relationship. So you ask why, what happened? What's happened in the last couple of years, the last, maybe I'd argue the last five or six years, uh, to push us to a, a period which is more contentious and a period of more competition? I think three or four things have happened. The first is it's natural. As China has risen in the world, has become more of a global uh, impact, a global impact in the world, it has come up against the other global power in the world, the United States. So it's natural that you'd have more points of competition. I think the second thing is that President Xi is a unique Chinese leader, and he has been more aggressive at home in terms of pursuing his goals, and he's been more aggressive abroad. There's no, really doubt, there's no real doubt about that. We see it in a number of areas, right, with respect to Chinese foreign policy, the Belt and Road Initiative, the formation of the uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. You see it in Chinese claims in the South China Sea. It's been a more aggressive foreign policy by uh, uh, by, uh, by President Xi. And I think in the United States is viewed as the period that was kind of characterized at least, you know, kind of colloquially as the Deng Xiaoping, Biden, you know, kind of bide your time, hide your, cap your capabilities period is no longer the period, no longer the case with respect to uh, with China. I think the third thing is this, is that the story that we told ourselves in the United States about China uh, turned out not to be accurate. And that story was this that as China became uh, wealthier, uh, that its political system would change. Uh, and it would become, it would look a lot more like a Western democracy in terms of political outlook and political practices. That has turned out not to be the case. China has gone on a, a distinct journey uh, of its own, uh, of its own in, terms of, uh, in terms of management of its government and management of its society. Very different than what was projected, I think. So there's, there's the kind of a, uh, it was a reaction to that, I think. Uh, and the last thing we can talk about is I think there has been a retreat by the United States in the world, which China has, I think, earlier than I thought it was going to be moving, uh, has, had to, uh, has had to fill. The result has been really a rethink of U.S.-China relations in the United States. Um, that rethink, by the way, is quite broad. It's not just the Trump administration. That rethink involves, it's bipartisan. It is across institutions. It involves the Congress. It involves the intelligence community. It involves the defense uh, uh, establishment. It involves NGOs. It involves the business community. Uh, with a really is kind of a, a significant rethink of U.S. 
of U.S.-China relations. Uh, so it's not just about the Trump administration. I think that's a, that's a mistake to think that, uh, that it's solely about US, pol U.S. policy under the Trump administration. It's not. Uh, I also think, by the way, there's a rethink not just in the United States, but also in China, which we can talk about. I'd like to hear the, from the Council General on this. They're the, the, uh, uh, the party leadership is meeting in the next couple of weeks, I think, uh, uh, for their important summer meetings. And, I'm, and I, I would be pretty certain that the U.S.-China relations is high on the list of, uh, of priorities that are being, that are being, uh, that are being um, considered. The other point is it's just not about trade. Uh, trade gets a lot of the publicity, obviously. It's been on the front pages of the newspaper for a lot, large part of the last year. It moves markets, as it did in the last week, uh, especially. But it's not just about trade. This is a broader discussion, and the competition is broader. It, incl it includes geopolitical competition. It includes military affairs. It includes ideological issues as well. Uh, and it mo very importantly, I think, uh, concerns uh, technology and technology competition. Uh, bottom line, I think, is that we're in a new era of U.S.-China relations. The contours of that era are not clear yet. The rules of the road are not clear yet at this point. They are in development. In my view, that it's going to take an extended period of time for this to develop. And we'll have a period of uncertainty and volatility in the relationship, perhaps for an extended period of time, while we work through this new era of uh, U.S.-China relations. I'll finish, Peter, if I might, just on a couple of points on trade and technology. Um, on trade. Uh, as I said, this gets most of the attention in the press right now, um, the, trade, the trade negotiations and the disputes between the United States and China over trade issues. By the way, this has been building for a long time. My judgment is that if Hillary Clinton had been elected president or Donald Trump was elected president, either we're going to have to deal with these trade issues, right? And, uh, and in particular, President Trump focuses on the bilateral trade deficit. I think the more difficult issues, which are part of the negotiations, obviously, is the way Chinese treat, Ch China treats foreign companies. Uh, and, uh, uh, in their activities in, uh, uh, in China. Additionally, trade gets so much attention because it really is at the center of Trump foreign policy. Uh, if you think about it, the United States today is in trade disputes, discussions, if you will, or in some places conflict, in almost every region of the world simultaneously. So trade really is at, uh, at the core of US foreign policy under Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump in, uh, is a uh, is you know, our first president who wasn't a political the elected leader or a military officer before becoming president. But that doesn't mean he hasn't had a public profile. It doesn't mean he hasn't had public views. And one of the things that he's been consistent on over the years is his critique of U.S. trade and the critique of the, of the trade deal the United States has entered into. I think this will remain at the center of Trump foreign policy for the pendency of his, uh, his presidency. Um, we've had 12 rounds of negotiation. The last one, um, in my judgment, uh, really um, kind of uh, disassembled the arrangement that had been reached at the G20 meeting in Osaka a couple of weeks ago. Uh, at that meeting, uh, President Xi and President Trump seemed to have agreed that there would be purchase of agricultural goods, there would be some pulling back on restrictions on Huawei, which is China's most important and largest telecommunications firm, and that there would be a truce in the application of tariffs. Uh, that, uh, as a result of the last round of trade negotiations, um, seems to have collapsed, and you've had a lot of rapid succession steps taken uh, by, uh, by both sides. My bottom line on trade is that I think we're much less likely to reach a trade deal this year, in one person's opinion, uh, given uh, the time, uh, given the number of issues that are now on the table, given, I think, some, uh, some issues around trust, uh, and, and bottom line also, some of the difficulty of the issues that we face uh, in, these, uh, in these negotiations. And I think that you could have tariffs on most, if not all, of China imports in the United States uh, for an extended period of time. On September 1, the president has said that he's going to put uh, additional tariffs on the last $300 billion worth of imports into the United States. That will mean that the United States has tariffs on every import into the United States, including a lot of consumer goods, um, which will uh, put, by the way, the United States in a role where it has the highest tariff level of any of the G7, uh, G7 countries. Uh, we'll have to see after the end of the year. 2020, can, a lot of things can happen in the election year with respect to policy. Last thing I'll say is on uh, technology. So trade gets all the attention. It's not the main game, uh, in my judgment. I think the main game is the competition between the United States and China over leadership in the technologies and industries of the future. Uh, again, this is uh, in some ways natural. Uh, the United States has a lot of issues with the way China pursues it, but this is really kind of a, this is really the key and the most difficult, I think, issue uh, facing, us, uh, facing us right now. The United States has never faced a competitor like uh, China with respect to economic and trade. Uh, and the technology. If you think about it, the United States for a period of time in the late 50s and, 19th, and early 1960s 
believed it had a competitor in the Soviet Union in space. And we had the so-called Sputnik moment, right, beginning in the late 1950s, coming into the 1960s. By the way, the United States should concentrate, really kind of reflect on that period, because we're still living off a lot of the investments we made uh, in that period, when the United States invested heavily uh, in its technology, research and development, education system. Um, and I think it may be time for the United States to take another look at an effort like this. It really is a lot more about us than it is about the outside world, ultimately. We'll put that aside for the discussion, though. Um, and you reflect on the fact that the United States has gotten tremendous security and prosperity benefits over being the technology leader in the world since 1945. Uh, and this is now uh, at issue. So the United States has undertaken a broad effort uh, to try to address issues in the technology area that where it believes China is not behaving uh, appropriately and to protect the US advantage. This is most uh, directly seen in the case of Huawei, the company I mentioned, the largest technology or, or you know, telecommunications company in uh, China. But the United States has undertaken a global effort uh, to try to um, stand in the way of Huawei becoming the key provider of 5G infrastructure around the world, kind of the next phase in connectivity, which is really going to be a, re a revolution in, uh, in, uh, in technology. Um, that effort has, has been uneven, but it's going to be broader than Huawei. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, as I said, there's a, there's a broad effort underway to protect U.S. technology. Uh, you see it, there's significant restrictions now on Chinese investment in the United States. There's going to be significant restrictions on, on U.S. technology leaving the United States, I think, in the next, uh, in the next year or so. This, by the way, uh, and I'll finish up on this, uh, Peter, it's a special challenge for universities, um, where we've had, uh, for a long time, a pretty collaborative system uh, with respect to the development of technology. I think that system's under pressure. It's under pressure for a number of reasons, including concerns in the United States about counterintelligence and, and um, intellectual property theft. But it puts universities in a difficult position, I think. And it puts companies in a difficult uh, position. It's going to have to be addressed. All things point to a uh, progressive decoupling in the technology area at this point. And that points to a broader deglobalization. And these are really important issues for us to address. So we're here at an important moment uh, where a number of really key issues have been put on the table. I'm not sure that they have been fully thought through on either side, uh, uh, which makes this conference so timely. Thank you. So uh, that was a terrific uh, beginning in uh, setting the stage. Uh, and I'd like to turn to our uh, esteemed colleague from China, Ambassador Chong Ping, to uh, offer some initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dean, uh, Mr. Honorable Mr. Donny Long, uh, Mr. Hartley. Uh, it uh, gives me a great pleasure to join you in this uh, panel discussion. I know uh, together with uh, many of our friends uh, present in this audience, uh, you have made great contribution yeah, to the uh, China-US relations over the years. So uh, thank you very much for what you have done. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, greetings from Ambassador Choi. And I know uh, he has many friends uh, among the audience here. So um, I think at present, China's US relationship is standing at a critical juncture uh, amid the escalating uh, trade disputes and tensions in other areas. Uh, where the relationship is heading to is uh, causing big concern among people both in China and the United States. I know uh, many people here in the audience also share the same concern and worry. We uh, noticed that a big debate uh, on US-China policy is going on in the United States uh, among the academic and strategic circles. So I think uh, it's most timely to have this kind of conference and I hope that uh, this forum will uh, help to lead the general public to think deeply what kind of China-US relationship we need to shape uh, for the future. I think I'm going to share a few points of my observation and thoughts on the uh, current China-US relations. First on China's development. The uh, current US-China policy debate is very much focused on China's development or the rise of China. For some people in the United States, 
China's development is perceived as a threat, which is a challenge to the uh, supremacy of the United States. Hence, in order to contain China, they think they can do anything or change any position, such as one China principle, which we consider as the uh, cornerstone of the uh, relationship. We believe uh, this kind of uh, antagonist approach is, by, is based on the ideological prejudice and zero-sum game mentality, which is very dangerous and should be discarded. Um, I don't know whether they have ever thought about uh, what kind of con consequences it will bring about by doing such things like undermining the very foundation that the relationship is built on, or try to decouple the uh, two countries' economies, or even advocating the so-called clash of civilization. The questions that pose to us are what kind of future China-US relationship do we want? Do we really want to see China-US relations become more confrontational and locked into a kind of new Cold War? Or do we really want to see, do we really want to let China-US relationship fall into what is called the Shusidesis trap that we are going, we are trying to avoid? And I think, uh, I believe uh, none of us want to see that happen. Uh, China is a country with nearly 1.4 billion people. So we have an inherent right of development. And we think uh, our development is solely for the purpose of providing a better life for our people and achieving the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And we have said on many occasions that we have no intention to scramble for supremacy with the United States, nor do we want to overturn the current international order and system where China is also an active participant, facilitator, as well as important contributor. However, we do have legitimate interests we need to defend. And China also made tremendous progress in the past four decades. And we have also found a very a viable road of development that fits our condition. We also have many favorable conditions for the future development. So no matter what happens, Chinese development will not stop, nor could it be stopped. Uh, second, on the current trade friction, equal footing and mutual respect is needed to exert maximum pressure will not work. Uh, as you know, uh, the tariff measures right now has covered all the uh, Chinese imports uh, with, his, with the uh, latest tariff measures imposed on the rest of uh, 300 billion uh, worth of Chinese imports. And the scale and intensity of, tra of uh, such trade war is never seen in the history of world trade. Uh, throughout the year-long process of uh, trade negotiation, uh, we have seen constant flip-flops, which dampened the hope of reaching agreement on the dispute. The most recent example is the bridge of consensus reached by the two countries' leaders at a summit meeting in, o in Osaka. During the meeting in Osaka, the two leaders have agreed to restart trade consultation on the basis of equality and mutual respect, with no, with no new tariff to be imposed by the US side. And after the conclusion of the latest round of consultations in Shanghai, the US side has also used the word constructive to describe this round of consultation. As tensions were subsiding, and China was about to restart importing of, agriculture, of U.S. agricultural products. We saw the U.S. side once again resort to the measure of trade bullying. So some people perhaps believe that by exerting maximum pressure, China 
will give in. As a matter of fact, this is counterproductive, and it won't work. We have repeatedly stated that we don't want to fight a trade war. However, we are not afraid of it. If it becomes inevitable, we will fight to the end with firm resolve. We believe trade war is a double-edged sword. It makes no winner and cannot be won easily. Try to weaken Chinese economy will not make U.S. economy stronger. It will also jeopardize the world economy as well. We believe all negotiations and consultations must be based on equality and mutual respect, and any agreement should be mutually accommodative and mutually beneficial. We hope uh, with joint efforts we can put China-U.S. trade disputes back to the right track of settlement. Third, on people-to-people -people exchange. Uh, we believe a good relationship is based, on, is based on better understanding, friendship, and close contact between our two peoples. For years, the people-to-people -people connection between China and the United States remained strong. Uh, take uh, Southern California as an example. Last year, we have 1.2 million Chinese tourists visiting LA, and here in Southern California, we have over more than 40,000 Chinese students studying in different universities. So this not only promotes a mutual understanding of friendship, but also contributes to the local economy and university development. However, some of the attempts to limit people-to-people -people exchanges based on national security reasons are disturbing. Though we believe national security for any sovereign nation is vital to its core interest, Yet, what is important is that we need to draw a clear line between maintaining the real international security and ensuring the normal scientific education exchanges and cooperation. We should not generalize or politicize the concept of national security, let alone to set barriers to prevent science cooperation, which is beneficial to the progress of mankind educational exchanges, which is important to the future of our kids. Fourth, China-U.S. relationship is and will, mean, uh, and will remain one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world. China and U.S. face many common challenges and share a broad range of common interests. There are many global and regional issues that require our two countries to cooperate. We need to continue the advanced development of this relationship, which is based on coordination, cooperation, and stability. We need to give up the zero-sum or winner-takes-all mentality to ensure that competition between our two countries is conducted in a benign way. We need to manage our differences by enhancing strategic dialogue for more strategic trust. And we can also strengthen our cooperation where we have common interests. So I hope this forum will help the uh, general public to understand the importance of China-US relationship and come up with some positive views and ideas on its future development. And I look forward to uh, joining in, this, in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, let's uh, turn to the last of our opening remarks uh, from Steve Hadley. Well, good afternoon. I, uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and I want to congratulate the authorities here at UCSD for this conference. I think it's very timely uh, and very useful, and, and uh, it's, uh, I think, a, a very important initiative. I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> excuse me, how we got where we are and how to get out of where we are. Um, I have been astonished, as someone who's been in Washington now for more years than I'd like to recount, how quickly the view among foreign policy elites on China hardened over the last three or four years. 
<clears throat> and what you've seen now in a really astonishing way is that uh, many of elite increasingly see China this way. They're a geopolitical hegemon. They are an economic predator. They're a military threat and an ideological rival. And that's a far cry from how most people saw China four or five years ago. So how did this come to pass? I think it starts where Tom Donilon started which is China's evolution over the last uh, decade. And I think he laid it out. We have a China that is much more ambitious diplomatically, taking a central role on the world stage, and with bold initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative, which I think is the most strategic initiative so far by any country in the 21st century. Um, it is more assertive militarily with its military modernization and what it's doing in the East China Sea, South China Sea, the Indian Ocean. It's more aggressively economically. It is promoting national champions like Huawei in key 21st century technologies around the world while increasingly closing its market to foreign investment and participation. That's the trend we've seen over the last four or five years. And I would say it's more contentious ideologically. It is promoting an authoritarian, authoritarian state capitalism as an alternative to what we consider to be market-based democratic systems. Tom mentioned that President Xi seemed to have abandoned Deng Xiaoping's hide your strength, bide your time, as, and as really uh, we've seen China step forward to take what I think President Xi thinks is its rightful role in the world and the place that historically has played in the world, except for about the last 150 years. Uh, I think President Xi actually stepped forward a little, maybe five or 10 years too soon. That he's in fact uh, awakened the sleeping dragon, and the sleeping dragon is actually is not China, it's the United States. For China's new challenging posture has caught many Americans by surprise. We were focused elsewhere, we were focused on the war on terror, we were focused in the Middle East, we were focusing on our own economic challenges. And I think it's resulted in a bit of strategic panic uh, among the American foreign policy elite and a fear that we've kind of missed the boat on China. And I think on balance that strategic pa uh, panic is probably a good thing because it has forced elites and policymakers to focus on China, what China is up to and ask the question, of what are we going to do about it? I think we do not yet have a national policy or strategy on China. We have what one person called, we have an attitude towards China right now, which is you push back on China everywhere and every place. Uh, unfortunately, I think this reaction has been seized on by some in China to argue, I think wrongly in my view, that the United States has a grand strategy with respect to China. It is to contain China to constrain its economic growth, to limit its global influence, and to undermine its political system. And you see now people saying in China that the United States is somehow behind the popular unrest in Hong Kong, and it's aimed at China. I think that is not true at all, but I think that is uh, one, of the, one of the attitudes that uh, we're seeing in China. So the attitudes have hardened on both sides, and I think that explains the current impasse, particularly on the US-China trade negotiations. But I think that the uh, American foreign policy elite and the poss and policymakers are beginning to get their, their bearings a bit and to develop the outlines of the US response to what China has been doing, and I think conferences like this will accelerate that process. I think that we are beginning to accept that there is a new era in U.S.-China relations, uh, that it is going to be a much more competitive relationship than in the past. I think we're also beginning to accept that a lot of our problems today in the United States are of our own making. They're not China's fault. They're our fault. And to compete successfully with a more assertive China, We've got to get our own house in order. And this means our political system needs to work better to solve some of the long-standing socioeconomic problems that we've been talking about for over a decade, whether it's our broken immigration system, 
our need for entitlement reform, our need for better educational and health care systems. These are old issues, and we don't seem to be making progress on them. It means we need to invest in our physical infrastructure, our roads and our bridges, our digital infrastructure for broadband, high-speed internet and communications, and our human infrastructure, our secondary and primary schools, our community colleges, jobs training, skill training uh, to equip young people for the jobs of the 21st century. And we have to increase dramatically our investment in research and development in the key 21st century uh, technologies, not because China's investing in them, but because we need to invest in them for the own prosperity and security of our people. Things like artificial intelligence, 5G communications, quantum computing, autonomy, robotics, bioengineering. It's a long list. Finally, it means we need to work with our friends and allies in meeting the challenge posed by China. That is a, that is a key element if we are going to manage the challenge that I think China represents. Now, having said all that, I think at the same time it's emerging that uh, almost no one wants a China that is an American adversary, particularly not the American people. And you see that in the polling uh, even today. There's little desire for a permanent confrontation, much less conflict with China. Uh, that would dismantle, if not destroy, the global economic system that has brought so much prosperity and progress to both of our countries and to the world. And our current economic interrelationship and interdependence benefits both countries. And economic decoupling would set back innovation, it would set back economic growth, and it would set back the prosperity of both peoples. And finally, our two nations must cooperate in meeting global challenges. And we all know the list. It's climate change, it's resource scarcity, it's health pandemics, it's terrorism, it's a long list. And neither nation is going to achieve its own objectives if we can't find a way to cooperate on those issues, whether it's the Chinese dream or the American dream. So the challenge, what's the challenge? The challenge is to be both strategic competitors and strategic cooperators at the same time. And to not let the strategic competition that we will face drive us into becoming adversaries or enemies. No one should want that. There are not a lot of historical precedents for managing this kind of relationship. I think where we need to start is what Tom hinted at. We need to develop rules of the road that will bound our competition and will put us on a level playing field, recognizing that it's not a zero-sum game, that we're not going to put each other out of business, nor should we try. Uh, and that some, we're going to compete, we're going to win some, we're going to lose some. China's going to win some, they're going to lose some. So we need uh, a, a competitive coexistence framework for U.S.-China relations. Now, that term is not original with me. I heard it somewhere. I don't know where. It could have been from one of you in the audience. And if you identify yourself, I'm prepared to give you full credit for that phrase. Um, but that's what we need. Um, and at the same time, we need to strengthen our cooperation that can help lead the world in solving the global challenges that threaten all of us. So I think that is the way how we be solve the problem of how we can be both strategic competitors and strategic cooperators at the same time. And I think the conference that we're going to have over the next three or four days will help define the way ahead within that framework. Thank you very much. Thanks very, thanks very much for those thoughtful remarks from all three of our panelists. I'm going to start in uh, reverse order uh, with Steve to ask Steve a question. Uh, which, uh, in a sense, was framed uh, by the ambassador. He said, you know, China is not going to 
uh, turn around under a campaign of maximum pressure. That alone will not coerce China into a change in policy. And in fact, in negotiation, we all know that we use pressure selectively, but we also try, in a sense, to induce in the other side uh, a reconsideration of what their own best interests are and to find, if you would, if not allies, at least people who are thoughtfully willing to reconsider some of the policies. So in this time of uncertainty, where we don't have a set strategy, the rules of the road are muddy, uh, if you were the national security advisor called in uh, next year, uh, what one or two things would you do as a signal to uh, China and its leadership and its engaged uh, citizens and thoughtful uh, academics and uh, technocrats to try to get them to start reconsidering what their best interest is in the relationship? Well, uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me try to, to and, and you know, when you, you're working within the framework of this administration, and that's, uh, that's a problem. I think a lot of people uh, in this room, I think Tom would agree, I had, was on a panel with Susan Rice, uh, was Tom's successor, and um, she had the same view. I, I probably wouldn't be where we are. Uh, I think we had a chance through the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the, the so-called TTIP, which was a trade and investment arrangement with Europe, to get maybe 60, 65 percent of the world's GDP in a high standards trade agreement. And if we'd done that, I think we would have had actually China knocking on our door to become part of it. And that was a framework that would allow us to address these trade issues. Now, the Trump administration, its wisdom, did not try to go in that direction. And they are trying to do it in a different way, using tariffs really as a cudgel to try to open up these issues. Um, it's probably not the way I would do it. Uh, but I think it's important to be done, because it looks, it has to be said that a lot of us in both the Obama and the Bush administrations have been talking about these problems with China for a long time. The business community has been talking about these problems with China for a long time and getting no results. And those times when we have gotten agreements of things, the implementation has been wanting. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that, and I think the ambassador could explain it. This, you know, this is, if you think about where China has been, it's extraordinary what it has done in the last 40 years. 50 years, its own development, the lifting of hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. You know, they're, they're catching up with themselves. And we keep saying, go faster, faster, faster. You know, we've been working at some of these issues for 250 years. They've been working at them for 50 years. And there's explanations for it, but it's resulted in a lot of frustration on the American side. And I think both Republicans and Democrats say, this may be the only chance to get these issues addressed. And of the issues addressed, the most important ones are not for China to buy more stuff from us to narrow the trade deficit. It's actually, in my view, not even opening up the China market to U.S. trade and investment, though that's a very good thing for China because it will cause more competition and actually help reform China. The real thing is this problem, and you see it in Huawei. We can't live with a situation where China gives national champions like Huawei control of the China market, 50 or 60 percent of the China market, subsidies and favorable financing, and then unleash them onto the world to underprice our companies and put them out of business in these high technology areas that define the 21st century. That won't work. We've got to find a way where in everybody, all our countries, the United States, China, and the Europeans can participate in these new technologies. They're too important for the security and prosperity. So we've got to get a new model, and that is the crunch point. And I hope the Trump administration really sticks to this so we can have that kind of conversation with China, because otherwise we're going through, going to go through a very rocky time. Ambassador, uh, we've heard uh, the Americans on this panel 
talk about uh, a change in attitudes uh, in the United States in the foreign policy circles, and also uh, a changing sort of reaction among the American public. But when we take a look at the polling data about American perceptions of China and attitudes towards China, it isn't by any means uh, a strongly negative view. Uh, it's a very mixed view. In many ways, it's a nuanced view uh, by the American public. Uh, one of your jobs being in Los Angeles as Council General is to go out and engage in the American community, talk with people, whether they are in the business leadership circles or, in a sense, the everyday life and organizations of uh, American society. And I wonder if you could share with us your reflections on what you're hearing in these conversations uh, here in the United States. Well, uh, you're right. I think, uh, obviously, uh, we see uh, among the uh, general public um, uh, the uh, impression on China uh, is perhaps uh, better than, say, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and I think uh, that's partly because of the kind of people-to-people uh, -people connection, uh, especially uh, with so many students coming to study in the United States and with so many people traveling to the United States and also the other way to China. So I think that helps uh, the kind of uh, understanding. I think uh, if you look at the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, video clips uh, on Chinese uh, social media, uh, you can see lots of American ordinary tourists uh, simply uh, talk about uh, nice things about uh, highway speed and what, what the kind of, uh, say, uh, pleasant experience. So I think all this help uh, the people yeah, to change their kind of uh, impression, which used to be dominated or influenced by the uh, media, say, uh, by the media reports. So I think that's one thing. Uh, I think you're right. I think uh, here one of our mission is to promote the kind of a mutual understanding. And also, that is very much needed uh, for the current uh, bilateral relations. So, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, what is more important is the kind of uh, strategic trust. And uh, frankly speaking, I think uh, uh, why, for instance, uh, Mr. Hartley, when you were the uh, National Security Advisor, or Mr. Dano, when you are the when you were the security advisor, national security advisor, I think we have lots of uh, uh, dialogue uh, mechanisms, you know, on strategic level, and which we think uh, help a great deal, yeah, to first of all enhance the uh, the uh, mutual understanding, and also helps to uh, solve some of the uh, outstanding issues. So, but the trouble is that right now. Uh, uh, almost all these kind of uh, dialogue mechanisms have remained inactive, except the uh, trade negotiation. That's the only one that's been still alive. But that's only. But that kind of it's not a mechanism. I think it's a simply a negotiation, uh, just for the purpose of solving the current trade disputes. So, uh, so I think uh, that kind of thing is not very helpful. And I think when you talk with Chinese young people, especially when they look at what the United States has done, obviously they will get a conclusion that the United States is taking a kind of a policy to contain, to contain China. Like Steve said, like uh, 5G, Huawei. Yeah. You tr it seems that all the necessary, all the possible means that you can, you can apply have been used to block, to block Huawei. And you even not only prevent Huawei from, en from entering 
into U.S. market, but also try to persuade other countries. Yeah, even not U.S. allies, even the uh, developing countries, third world countries, yeah, not to use Huawei equipment. So I think we simply can understand whether it's a campaign, whether it is a containment or not a containment. So I think uh, for many of our Chinese people, we simply cannot understand, I think, uh, what's going on. And uh, if you look at uh, the many uh, public uh, statements by the senior officials of the United States. So that will easily give the kind of people a, a, a sort of impression that you have changed the policy on China and it's simply because uh, you want to prevent China from overtaking the United States. I think uh, my understanding is that more or less the U.S. foreign policy is very much focused on maintaining the U.S. supremacy in the world. So I think that's the issue. Thank you. Well, I think that that's uh, an odd statement of the strategic issue facing us today about how we frame uh, what this dialogue is really about. Um, and I want to follow up on the example of, uh, given by the ambassador just now involving Huawei, but more broadly about the issue of uh, this technological uh, competition. Uh, we're sitting in one of the world's great research universities. Uh, we feel the stress and strains that are uh, coming out of uh, these tensions uh, here. Uh, certainly our labs are really a reflection of uh, bringing together the United Nations of expertise from around the world. And the United States, in a way, is no longer capable of driving the world's R&D agenda on its own in a way that it might have been in the 50s and 60s. It's now much more a global creation of knowledge. Uh, really, Tom, in reading your work, I, uh, I have gotten a sense that in a way, it's a replay of some of the discussions we had about Japan in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, where there was a despair about the Japanese challenge to American technological leadership. And what we discovered in the end was that we had to heal ourselves, uh, not just simply uh, be in confrontation with Japan, although that confrontation was important on certain issues. I wonder if you could say a word about how you think we can uh, really achieve uh, technological innovation if, in fact, we head towards what you refer to as a growing technological separation. Because the two are a tension, and it goes very much to the heart of the future of the U.S. China relationship. Well, I'm going to work through uh, some of those things. First of all, I think, Steve, on the um, cooperative coexistence, I think that's a Campbell Sullivan phrase. In the, uh, in the latest foreign affairs piece, so I'll give credit for credit to their own phrase. Um, secondly, on Huawei, Huawei and the The Huawei the situation, it's a, it's a complicated situation. Steve pointed to one of the most important principles at stake here, and that is reciprocity. I think, Steve, you were referring to reciprocity of treatment as between companies. In other words, having the United States companies treated uh, with the, in the same way in their activities in China as, as they are, have the opportunity to participate in the United States, and that hasn't been the case. Uh, and that's what a lot of this is about. That was the subject of the Bilateral Trade Investment Treaty that was uh, being negotiated uh, up until the end of the uh, Obama administration. And it was the subject of, as Steve said, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Negotiation and Treaty, uh, which uh, would have addressed in a multilateral way a lot of these issues, I think. Um, uh, maybe, and I, th I think, in a more effective way. It's not original with me, um, but it's been said that pulling out of the TPP may be the most, uh, most significant mistake in Asia uh, since Vietnam by the United States. Um, so there, were, there are a lot of different ways to do this rather than the way uh, we're, doing it, we're doing it today, number one. Number two is, um, uh, as you know, Peter, I've been very focused on the following proposition, uh, that uh, history shows us uh, that uh, the United States can undertake a series of steps and maybe affect the conduct of other countries somewhat, mostly at the margin. 
uh, you know, countries that are going to pursue their development, uh, the development strategies and try to pursue their advantage, uh, and that it would behoove us, and it has in the past, and we have some amnesia about this, right? It really has been much more effective for us to ask ourselves what we can do uh, about meeting the technological challenges, and they involve all the things that Steve, that Steve laid out. Uh, you know, with respect to research and development, um, it is a broader research and development world. I mean, you're absolutely right about that. Um, but the United States has been going in exactly the wrong direction. Uh, the, the current budget proposed to the Congress by the administration actually has research and development, R&D, basic research, right, uh, is actually dropping in terms of percentage of GDP. Uh, and that should be that should be reversed. You know, we have a we have a system in this country that's been developed over the half over the last seven years, which has been enormously effective. Which is the triangular system of the United States government investing in basic R and D, uh, not looking for an immediate return, uh, having a spillover effect on the one 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 point on the triangle. The other point in the triangle being the great research universities uh, that can be uh, can be kind of a energized by the investments, and the other part of the triangle has been commercialization through our great companies. That has been a tremendously successful model for us, and we are not pursuing that model with the same vigor and focus on the key technologies and energy of the future that we have in the past. I think that is really an important part of this, and along with the other things that Steve mentioned, which is investment in education and infrastructure and human capital, a sensible immigration policy. Uh, all we, we could, you actually could get um, the top five Republican economists in the country and the top five Democratic economists in the country and probably in 90 minutes come up with a sensible program, I think, for addressing what we should be doing to meet the challenge posed, uh, uh, posed by China. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be engaging with China uh, to press where we think things are unfair, uh, where we have issues, where we have uh, and real issues around reciprocity and the steps that they're taking, but it needs to be really kind of rooted, I think, in what we're, what we're doing. I think as a, as, as a country. That really is the lesson, I think, of the last, of the last 75, 75 years. Now, uh, two other quick points. On, on the point that the ambassador made about mechanisms, this is a really important point. A trade negotiation is not a strategic dialogue. A trade negotiation, trade is not a comprehensive strategy for dealing with a relationship as complicated, complex, and important as the United States-China relationship. Uh, it's one piece of it. It's important, you know, but it is not a strategic engagement. And today, we have a trade negotiation, but we do not have strategic engagement, in my judgment. Uh, and we need to have kind of a, a strategic engagement to look at things like intentions and interests and scenarios. And where is this going in the kind of broad thing? Because this is, this is going to be a complicated piece of business going forward, including, by the way, some things we're not going to agree on in, ideological, in the ideological sphere. We are two different systems in the world, and a broader point, the world is dividing uh, between state-centric systems, in some cases authoritarian versus liberal democracies, right? And this is an important set of conversations, I think, to have uh, going forward. So we don't have a, uh, a mechanism. And the last thing I think I'd say with respect to technology and with respect to the relationship generally, this is from a U.S. perspective now. Um, I think if I were giving a briefing uh, to the president, it would be an important part of the top three or four things that I would say, what I would say which is it is really important for the United States to take full advantage of one of its unique assets, and that is our alliance system and our partnerships in the world. Um, that is a unique asset that the, United, that the United States has, and we haven't pursued our strategies and priorities via those, uh, via those alliance systems, as a matter of fact. And that's a matter of prioritization, style, zero-sum approach, transactional approach. Um, we, we are simultaneously, while we should be focused, I think, together, on trying to address some of these issues in the U.S.-China relationship and the China relationship with the world generally, we find ourselves having economic disputes um, with our allies at the same time and sometimes with the same vigor. Uh, so those would be the three or four things that if I were going to brief the president on the question that you asked is we need a national focus on, on technology, on focus on what we're doing, not, not to leave, leave aside what China's doing, right? There are issues there that can be, be discussed and we should put pressure on those issues. It's best to put those pressure on issues, I think, through a multilateral, a lateral approach. And this is very much about what does a national innovation and revitalization program look like. At this point, what I'd like to do is to open ourselves to questions from the audience. But I haven't received the cards. Were they ever collected? Well, I see cards being held up, but that's not going to work. All right. So folks, you're going to join me in an experiment an experiment we've all lived through, which is the 
raising of hands for questions. I'm going to ask that we follow uh, a rule that we're not giving speeches. We're giving a question, and a, one question only, and a short question. Uh, and uh, let's uh, work uh, across the room, uh, getting a few hands up. All right? Well, there are the cards showing up belatedly, but uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go with the open route, because I can't read these cards quickly. <laughs> All right? Yeah. Right? This is, an, this, is an this is an education problem about right. the decline of penmanship in the age of the computer, right? right. <laughs> well, this is a research university with a large medical school, yeah. and the doctors, unfortunately, have set the precedent yeah. for handwriting. <laughs> the, uh, so uh, let's start uh, in, symbolically in the center. I happen to see one of our distinguished emeritus professors, Lawrence Cross, with his hand up. Larry. Just stand up and I'll, I'll repeat it. Both of the Americans on the panel talked about our relationships with our allies in mobilizing the issues to confront China. I, that's the question. Suppose the US was to mobilize uh, a coalition to confront China for trade distortions. Will China see that as a way to, uh, to face the uh, world community in a better way? Or is it a technique to surround China? It's terribly important how China embraces that kind of conflict. So this is a very uh, interesting question. We've heard uh, from our panelists that when we rejected TPP and these other major trade agreements at the end of the Obama administration, we caused this rift in the negotiating uh, efforts to have a more global statement. And in a sense, this turned us into a US-China bilateral issue. So would a reversion back to a more global collective effort make it easier for China to feel like it was a legitimate negotiation and perhaps one that is not so much win-lose between the two principal powers in the world. Uh, and maybe, Mr. Ambassador, I'll give you a moment to think about that while I invite one of our others to speak. This is, this is the kind of cooperation we need. <laughs> I wouldn't use the word confront. You know, one of the things we hear from our friends and allies is they don't want to be forced to choose between the United States and China. The United States for security relations, China for economic relations, that's not the framework. I think the, your point, though, is right. If we could work with our friends and allies and all be talking to China and have and be working this central agenda about the reciprocity, about uh, the treat treatment that foreign com companies get in China is not the same that China gets in our, com in, in our countries. Ours are open, theirs are increasingly closed. You'd want to do it in that way, in a conversation where we would have a common agenda of trying to address these issues, not trying to confront China or put it in a corner or making company countries choose. And that's, of course, the advantage of these bilateral, these multilateral frameworks we had with TTP and the similar TTIP with Europe. It was the right framework for in which to have this conversation. Well, it kind of sets, also, Professor, it sets the, um, it kind of sets the facts, right? The facts would are, uh, if you have markets the size, for example, of the United States and Europe combined, which are principal trading partners with, uh, with China, uh, and there are a set of rules uh, in that, uh, you know, in, the, kind of in those markets, as was the case in the TPP, as Steve said, with some, you know, 60 percent of world trade, that confronts China with a set of choices as to how it's going to in interact with the world in its own interest. Uh, and I think it's actually a much more effective, a more effective way, potentially, 
uh, to, to address it because you're basically kind of you're presenting, you're presenting the, the facts as to how the world has organized itself and the, and the basis on which China can either choose to engage in those markets which it wants to or not engage. Um, and I, think it's, I think it's a more effective, more effective way. It also, uh, again, from a pure strategy perspective here now as an American, right, uh, um, it, um, uh, you know, it, it, it allows you not to be divided, right, if you kind of agree in advance on your on your proposition. And the last thing is, it really starts to feel like the future uh, and the, kind of the way that the world is going, right? Uh, and again, kind of in China's interest to make a decision whether to join that or not. And it would be, in it, and it, then it becomes in its interest to join it. So, Mr. Ambassador, maybe you'd like to offer a comment. Yeah. That's all. Uh, uh, well, I think uh, building up uh, allies uh, uh, I think uh, it's a sort of a tradition of uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy, and especially uh, that was uh, pretty effective uh, during the Cold War. Uh, somehow, I should say that uh, you, st you still uh, uh, are very good at uh, uh, building up, uh, say, uh, allies. I mean, uh, uh, especially I think uh, when it comes to issues on China. Uh, on many fronts, I mean, uh, for instance, on some of the uh, geopolitical issues, as well as on the high-tech issues. I think you see many uh, signs of these kind of mobilizing your allies and friends, yeah, to set up barriers or block uh, China from doing doing so. So uh, we, we, we think uh, this is a kind of a Cold War mentality, uh, especially uh, in the present age of uh, globalization. I think uh, we need to uh, dismantle yeah, these kind of, uh, say, uh, wars, uh, which is built based on the ideological uh, uh, based on the different ideologies, I think. Because I think uh, for many people in the Western countries, they always think China is a different country with different ideology. So, uh, so I think that prevent the kind of international, co international cooperation uh, between China and Western countries. So I think we need to change that mentality. I think it's um, it depends on what the content of the of the arrangements are, right? You know, if you're if you're moving towards a kind of a a, a more open, more efficient and effective free market um, system with rules of reciprocity, um, you know, the, the view should be that that's in everybody's interest, right? You know, the the path we're on right now uh, is a path towards a distorting markets. Uh, you know, we see it already, right? We see it already in the you know, in the tariff wars that we've undertaken between the two countries right now, we see distortions already, I think, at vast few degree in the uh, supply chain arrangements around the world, um, which are being forced to make a, make a number of decisions based on guesses as to where you're going to have more or less uncertainty, where the tariff rates are going to be. And that's, just, that's a distortive, that's, I think that's distorting, and a better way would be to try to agree kind of more broadly on more open, uh, more open and fair and reciprocal approach. Um, and, one way to do that is to get agreement among like-minded countries. I use that phrase in addition to allies. Over here. All right, right over there. David Ignatius from the Washington Post. Um, as I'm sure everybody knows, we have a presidential election coming up uh, next year in the U.S. And one of the peculiar features uh, that I've been watching is that there's been, on the Democratic side been relatively little debate about this big strategic issue of the U.S. and China that we've been discussing. So I want to ask um, Tom and Steve, two former national security advisors, just to, th to think about that. Uh, Tom, it's strange that all, you and Steve agree on TPP, the wisdom of it, and yet uh, among Democratic candidates, it's like a, uh, almost a dirty word and was in our last election as well. Uh, 
Why is that? And is, why is there a livelier debate on the Democratic side? Steve, Republicans are traditionally the party of free trade, of global engagement, and yet those voices seem uh, strangely silent now. Uh, how can that change? Um, well, I can't answer for the Democratic side. Uh, I will say something about uh, that Madeleine Albright says. It's one of her great lines. She says, you know, the problem with, for most Americans, the problem with the word multilateralism is that it has too many syllables and it ends with an ism. And, and you know, I think it, it goes to the 2016 election, which was influenced heavily by a group of people that you've heard me say felt threatened by globalization, victimized by globalization, threatened by immigration, um, uh, betrayed by their politicians, uh, and, uh, and, and disadvantaged by the elites. And they took that out, in some sense, against multilateralism. They took it out against trade agreements. And they, that election, I think, brought to the attention of Washington-based elites real pain in the country that was not being addressed by our political system. And I don't think you're going to get the American people back to the notion that the United States needs to be engaged in the world, we need to be engaged with others in, in building these kinds of institutions until our political system and our economic system addresses these underlying grievances that I think are a reason why Donald Trump got elected and explain, and they're not just in the United States, they explain Brexit, they explain the rise of the extremist parties. Um, that issue needs to be addressed and, and it's, it's the hostility, I think in some sense wrongly, that people have, vi have visited upon the trade agreements that has turned the Republican Party away from free trade uh, because it's lost a good chunk of its base over that issue. I think if you look at the, actually the polling data is different. Uh, you know, the polling data shows that the, the, the most Americans understand and support engagement in the world, and most Americans understand and support engagement with allies and support generally free trade. Um, but I think Steve's exactly right that the, that the focus is, is quite domestic right now for understandable reasons. There are real differences between uh, the parties on approaches to economic issues, to health care issues, to immigration issues, and they're just, you know, the, an election always only has so much bandwidth. Uh, and I think that the bandwidth in the election today is understandably being taken up with a lot of the domestic, a lot of the domestic issues because there really is really deep division in the country. Uh, as Steve said, pre, you know, preceded by um, deep, really unrest in the country, particularly among a lot of our fellow citizens who have, uh, who have been um, felt left behind by uh, this era of globalization. Uh, and that has to be addressed. And I think that, that bandwidth uh, that, that you have in any given election, I think is being taken up uh, with, uh, uh, by, um, you know, by these domestic fo domestically, focused, domestically focused issues. At some point along the way, you'll have engagement on foreign policy, but it's not, it, and, and there is some engagement, um, which is uh, you know, how the United States and its president presents itself to the world. I think that has been a point of discussion. I think you'll see more of that from the Democratic side. Um, but um, it, we're going to be domestically focused, I think, for, uh, for, a period of, for a period of time. You know, Vice President Biden did give a foreign policy speech about three or four weeks ago, but the focus is going to be on the domestic challenges, I think, uh, for, uh, for a while now, given the bandwidth issues. In uh, reading the cards, uh, the, uh, I want to come to a final question trying to synthesize a number of specific uh, points raised in the cards. And if I could phrase it this way to all three of you, um, the relationship between the U.S. and China uh, developed uh, not always in perfect harmony, but, you know, in a progressive way over time. Uh, there were thoughts of rules of the ro road and some expectations. And that relationship had some boundaries that were set not just by diplomacy, but by the expectation of how each country worked. So, for example, other countries thought that the U.S. commitment to alliances and to the international institutions that we championed after the Second World War 
were sort of fundamental benchmarks for American foreign policy. We might not always stick to them, but that was more or less an anchor that was predictable. Uh, we thought in the United States that the major economic reforms that had taken place in China had led to a country that was more understandable to us, at least as an economy and a society of entrepreneurship worked than the traditional Soviet Union was during the Cold War. And there was some assumption that that would lead to political and uh, legal change in China. Uh, I don't know that most people thought that China would become a democracy, but it would be a more recognizable system and that that sort of created expectations about China's behavior in the world. Uh, on both sides now, uh, those assumptions are in doubt. What does that mean for the relationship between the two countries and how we sort out the rules of the world? Can I start with you, Steve? And yeah, I, I think what explains where we are is in some sense, um, we, we've said for a while that President, that the core constituency that elected President Trump was mad at the system and they wanted him to be the disruptor in chief. And that's what we got. He has reset the table on so many other, so many issues. What we, I think, are only beginning to realize that President Xi is a disruptor in chief. You know, we've talked about a very different sense of what China's role should be in the world. Uh, his uh, increasing consolidation of his own control, getting rid of uh, the, uh, the term limits and the sort of normal form of succession, in emphasizing the party, inserting the party down to very local levels in the social, economic, and political world. President Xi is also a disruptor. And so you have these two important countries, both led going through a period of disruption and change. And that makes managing the relationship difficult. Uh, and it requires us to have the strategic dialogue Tom talked about, to watch out for flashpoints, and there's one right now going on in Hong Kong that can really set back the election and have echoes into Taiwan, which is the one issue that really can blow up U.S.-China relations. So it requires a strategic dialogue. It requires avoiding these potential flashpoints, and it requires some time and patience because both systems are settling out and we need to sort of find a way forward in a setting where there's really disruption going on in both societies. That would be my, that would be my take. Um, you know, the, um, if the theory had been uh, you know, over the last really 25 years, one of convergence in systems, uh, particularly between the United States and China, and we've now entered in a period where the systems are diverging. Um, and that was, the, you know, that was the, what I meant when I said earlier that the story we told ourselves about China's development turned out not to be the direction in which it's gone. As a matter of fact, China has exp expressly rejected um, uh, the key pillars of, if you will, kind of a Western democratic liberal uh, political system uh, and opted to go in a very, very different, a very, very different direction. That makes the challenge harder. I think that's the, I think that's the key, the key point. That as you as we as, we, as the systems have have diverged, uh, the challenge of maintaining relationship is going to get is going to be more difficult. I think is kind of the bottom, uh, one of the bottom lines here of, uh, of the discussion as I see as I see the development. Uh, I want I, just for 10, 10 seconds on David uh, David Ignatius's question. David, if I were uh, going in uh, tomorrow morning to the first meeting with a new president on foreign policy as national security advisor. I think the first, in, in line with where the debate is right now in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the primaries, uh, I think the first sentence I would probably say is that no country has ever been able to maintain its diplomatic, military, political primacy absent maintaining its domestic vitality. Uh, and that does have to be the most important thing, I think, for the United States in terms of maintaining its power, position, influence, and authority in the world. Well, uh, as I've said, uh, uh, over the past 40 years, uh, we have achieved uh, great progress. And uh, I think uh, uh, we uh, 
the important thing is that uh, we have found a road pass uh, which uh, is uh, suitable for our own, say, uh, national conditions. So I believe uh, uh, Chinese development, China's development will continue. And, uh, and I, uh, I think uh, that will play a very constructive uh, role uh, to the peace and uh, prosperity yeah, of the world. I, I think uh, President Xi, uh, he's a great leader uh, with great vision and, uh, and, and also of a great, uh, a strong leadership. I think uh, uh, he also made it clear that uh, uh, he wants to achieve uh, the uh, goal of realizing the uh, rejuvenation of the uh, Chinese nation. I think, uh, and uh, so I think he's going to lead a country and lead a party. And I think uh, we have, and he also made it clear that China will take a different path, uh, so different in a way that, uh, so China will uh, take what we call the uh, uh, socialism with uh, Chinese own characteristics. Uh, so I think uh, the Chinese development will uh, go along that line. And uh, so uh, I think wh whatever happened, uh, we will simply focus on doing our things better. Yeah. And, uh, and we think that uh, we can work together with other countries. And I think uh, that provides a ground for a better relationship uh, between China and the United States. That's what I hope. Well, thank you for that. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. The <laughs> We've had a moment to see uh, how these big, uh, often uh, ferociously uh, discussed questions uh, can be uh, brought down to a level of uh, thoughtful reflection, listening to each other, and that that's the basis for not accepting that things will be as, you know, uh, easily resolved and that if we were just nice to each other, the problems will go away. These are real issues, but the real issues that are within two societies that are defining the future of the world, and those issues we have an obligation in the United States and China as a rising powerful country to be honest with ourselves about, and I can say on behalf of the University of California, San Diego, our 21st Century China program, and all that we do here, that we believe that the universities in China and the United States have a special obligation to be uh, beacons of exploration of the facts, of bringing together of our best young people to allow them to know each other, as the ambassador said, in a people-to-people -people way, but to create together, because that creativity will redefine the facts on the ground for both of our societies in the long term. And that is the true hope and the true uh, ambition of uh, our universities together. So I hope that you'll all join us as we progress in this era of discovery, of new possibilities, and of hard realities. Thanks for being with us today, and most thanks to our extraordinary panel.